from dead and buried. One of these years, hopefully, human humans will go to Mars, or perhaps the moon, or someplace other than the Earth. And the reason that they need something like meat to eat is because people eat meat to one extent or another. Even though uh, I bow to the insects, because I've been, you know, seriously, I've been, I've been working on a, uh, on a paper uh, on the bioethics of uh, in vitro meat. And uh, the anthropologists have concluded that our ancestors' first taste of muscle protein was in the form of insects before they started going out and trying to kill uh, larger game. So uh, insects are certainly edible. People are eating them all, all over the place. And you won't, you won't find any controversy with me about that. Just, just so you know. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, I wish I could extend the same. Uh, well, that's all right. Uh, that's, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> I, I, don't, I, I don't mind. All right. Uh, the uh, other point that I want to make is that the uh, idea of uh, growing uh, muscle. <coughs> in uh, an artificial medium, or more or less artificial medium, in uh, some sort of uh, vessel like a petri dish. Everybody likes petri dishes and test tubes for some reason. I frankly uh, have a tendency to like uh, all glass stills, but that's because of what comes out one end of them. Uh, the, the tendency is, is to think in terms of uh, any kind of uh, material that uh, can be produced in one of these vessels. And that's absolutely true. Uh, mostly that's what this is all about. But there's a difference in the approach that's quite important. I, no I noticed that uh, in one of the uh, things that uh, Nicholas uh, sent me, that there was a picture of something that purported to be in vitro meat. And yeah, those of you who, who receive our email will have seen that. Well, it, it's, it, it's a picture of uh, some sort of uh, globular material uh, that I assume came from uh, a, a TV program, didn't it? No, no. All right. Well, anyhow, it came, there, there, there was a uh, there was a very famous TV program that a uh, humorous uh, person uh, whose name I can't remember. I remember the scientist that he had whom he interviewed. His name is Dr. Marinoff, and uh, he works on uh, in vitro meat as well. Now his uh, method of uh, raising in vitro meat is by growing individual cells on particles of one sort or another. And how he expects to get the meat off the particles, I've never been able to figure out, but I guess he must know how he's going to do it. Anyhow, he was uh, more or less uh, attacked by his host, and uh, one of the pictures that appeared on TV was uh, one that looked like that blob, uh, which is what he was able to uh, come up with. And uh, a group in Holland, which uh, in my lab we call the Dutch, uh, came up with a, uh, another kind of uh, technique of raising uh, in vitro meat which involved using single cells as well. In contrast to that, in my lab, we do not use single disarticulated cells to set up our uh, muscle protein cultures. We use T 
tissue. Tissue is what we use because we're doing tissue culture. The other people are doing cell culture. Cell culture is what produces those amorphous blobs. What we produce is something that looks very much like the tissue that it, from which it was derived. And I have some uh, slides here that uh, I'll show you uh, to the best of my ability in a moment. On short notice, I couldn't come up with anything as elegant as that. Uh, even though this is a digital age, and reluctantly I have entered it. Uh, now, uh, Shall we have a pass the mic over to Dave for an introduction to insect eating and then come back to the Oh, you mean you want me to stop? Sure. <laughs> it's, it's my unfortunate task as moderator of the panel. <laughs> Sorry. Dave, uh, bring us up to speed on uh, insect eating. Who does it? Okay. Who's involved? Uh, I've been involved in the subject for about 12 years, and when I started, there were very few of us, specifically in North America um, and Europe, there were very few, and uh, there's a guy outside of Seattle, there's a guy in New Orleans, and the three of us would have cooking competitions at various locales. As of the last 18 months, there is much more of a community, uh, more of us in the U.S. than Canada or Europe, with the, once again the exception of the Dutch. They're, they're very progressive when it comes to the insects. Um, but uh, now there are, as of the last eight months, there are three companies in the U.S. seeking to commercialize entomophagy. And what's really nice is that not only do they know of each other, but they are finding ways to um, sort of, uh, thus far, carve out different kinds of niches and different markets. So it looks as though whether or not there's going to be an active collaboration, there's, there's no conflict at all. And we all met each other uh, in May uh, in Los Angeles for an insect cook-off. There was a four chef insect cook-off. I was one of the four. And I'm working with two out of three companies. I should add, despite the fact that I'm a CEO, I'm actually a, an English teacher by day. So I teach writing at a community college. And I have no business training whatsoever, nor entomology training, nor culinary training. So, <laughs> basically, only in entomology can a person know so little and be, be tarred with the name expert. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's actually pretty shocking how quickly I reach the edge of my knowledge and then have to admit the same. Um, however, that being said, uh, the scientific data is absolutely clear regarding both the nutrient load of insects, not just protein, but vitamins and minerals, uh, how they can compete at least on a level playing field with any other kind of food you mention. And of course, as you would all suspect, and as we all know almost intuitively, the relationship between inputs and output in terms of energy requirements and ECI, Energy Conversion Index, is really stark. So we want to talk about creating infrastructure and creating food security, given where our species is headed. Um, it's, it's a very simple story. Thank you. So one of the things I was curious about, the, the first question I, I think I always have for food is, what does it taste like? And Morris, the way you were describing the, um, the cell culture versus the tissue culture, Obviously, you'll get a different appearance with the tissue culture, but I'm assuming that the texture for someone eating it would be different, too. Have you, have you tried your own product? Do you know what it tastes like? Can you speculate? Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I can't answer your question directly without telling you that the, all of this information that I'm giving you has been published. And if you're interested uh, in the details, you can find that out by reading the publication. But uh, in answer to your question, no. And the answer to the question is no, because I decided I didn't want to come into uh, any kind of conflict with the uh, Food and Drug Administration 
at this point because we hadn't uh, gotten far enough to make it worthwhile. What we did have, though, is a uh, Smith panel. We had a uh, group of uh, employees, all female, uh, for very good reason because of the difference in attitude by males. And, uh, this is not sexist, in fact when uh, going into the supermarket and looking at food and so on and so forth. And they actually looked at the uh, fillets, as the British call them. No, they call them fillets, excuse me. Yes, they call them fillets. Uh, the way they looked to them before and after cooking, and they also smelled them before and after cooking, but they did not eat them because we did not want them to eat them. So we don't know what they taste like. But they certainly look exactly like what you would buy in a supermarket. And that was something that they said too. That this was, this was something that looked like we would buy it in a supermarket. So it smelled right, looked right, and uh, we didn't put a price on it so we don't know whether the price was right. But the idea of using the tissue, I think, is partly for that textural reason that if you if you do a cell culture, it, it has no... Um... Well, there's more to it than that. Uh, the fact is that a tissue is more than one type of cell. Although we speak of eating muscle, we're not just eating muscle, we're eating muscle and connective tissue and uh, the blood vessels that are in the... Uh, tissue and so on and so forth. So it's it's much more than just a pure culture of cells that we're eating. And in addition to that, the people who are who are raising cells in culture uh, for uh, food have to first set up a scaffolding for the cells to adhere to, so they can get a three-dimensional construct that they say will be the, uh, the food of the future. And uh, I should add something else that's also important, and that is that those uh, who are doing that also are mainly interested in stem cells. <clears throat> stem cells are the big thing. And uh, the reason they're interested in stem cells is because, as I'm sure you know very well, they are uh, capable of forming all sorts of different types of cells, including muscle. Unfortunately, the other thing that happens in cell culture is that the cells uh, become either spindle-shaped cells of one sort or another, you connect the tissue, or they become epithelial cells. They don't become muscle cells. We don't have to worry about that because our cells are already muscle cells and what we're looking for is proliferation of the muscle tissue uh, as sort of an add-on to the uh, culture of cell we start out with. And we've got a good basis for that. A uh, man by the name of Alexis Carell, of whom you may have heard, of course, he goes back to the 1920s, so possibly you never heard of him. But he was a Nobel laureate, and uh, he kept the chicken heart uh, going in Rockefeller, uh, Rockefeller uh, University, which was uh, the Rockefeller Institute at the time, going for years and years and years and years and years. And that was a tissue. It wasn't individual cells. It was cardiac tissue. Great. Um, it's almost unfair to ask you about taste day before we actually taste them, but what are people's appetites? Okay, sure. What's um, the range of taste and texture for, for insects? Well, uh, the two uh, kinds of insects that uh, the average American is most likely to try are crickets and mealworms, and I'm pretty sure that's exactly what you've got. Mm -hmm. In addition to the hot licks uh, material, I brought a kind of a neat surprise, and that is cricket flour bread. So for those of you who might say, nice, uh, um, 
So anyways, for those of you who might balk a little bit at consuming an insect that looks like an insect, the bread does a pretty good job of blending the ground insect into just a piece of bread. If you look very carefully, you will probably see an insect part. I don't know, because I didn't make the bread, uh, what percentage of the flour is cricket, um, ground up cricket. But it tastes like any other bread. By the way, before you eat, anyone allergic to shellfish will be allergic to insects. So that's a crustaceous, they're all arthropods. So I figured I'd mention that now before we get the epic pans out. Um, so therefore, uh, to, to finish speaking to what you were saying, uh, crickets and mealworms are fairly much the tofu, or even the zealot, if you will, of the food, of the insect food world. They will take on the flavors of what they're cooked with. Other insects, I've had about 50 varieties roughly, uh, have very strong flavors. Such as? Well, let's see. Um, wax worms, which are caterpillars that eat beeswax, have this really delightful, subtle, subtle buttery uh, experience that I, I think are very much like uh, pine nuts. <laughs> and stink bugs, which are very tasty, are um, slightly bitter and slightly herby, and I always describe them as kale with cilantro. <laughs> and then there are other, there are other things as well. Uh, for example, there are some dry caterpillars from a pony worm from various African countries, which I've been desperately trying to get a commercial source for. And they are extremely earthy, like a kind of dried mushroom mixed with beef jerky with like a dirt thing going on. But not unpleasant. Now I'm, now I'm salivating. Um, <laughs> I'm be watching this. <laughs> to to um, go to sort of a. Uh, oh, right. Sorry, we don't have mics. Um, or three mics, I should say. Uh, one thing that I'm, I'm curious about for both of you is when we talk about, you know, oh, the future of food. How far away might either of these kinds of foods be from both being able to be produced at an industrial scale and also being readily available for anyone, even if it's astronauts, not just sort of you and I going down to the store to actually eat? And um, and what how both how far away that is and what stands in the way? Like well, what are the things that need to be done before that can happen? Uh, your question is one that every person from uh, media who has uh, interviewed me and uh, my co-worker uh, asked. And the answer is that is a variable. And the variable, variable is governed by dollars. More money goes in sooner, the sooner will the product come out the other end. And that is a fact. There's no getting away from that, which is why scientists are always trying to get funded for their work. Without money, they can't do the work. That's the answer to the first part of the question. Uh, the second part of the question was what again? What actually? What work actually needs to be done? To well, what has to be? Yeah. Well, I, I I should preface what I'm going to say with the fact that um, in addition to being food for astronauts, uh, we were required to come up with other bright ideas about what else might be commercially viable and so on. And the answer is that we never anticipate anticipated and still don't that uh, beef steaks and lamb chops are going to be uh, pushed off the uh, shelves or the market or whatever by uh, our uh, method of uh, growing animal muscle in uh, vitro. What we did anticipate is that it would be nice to have some sort of semi-automatic or automatic system that will produce a sufficient quantity of edible muscle to keep people going for a certain length of time in areas where there is uh, a famine or in military uh, operations, 
submarines which stay underwater for long periods of time, et cetera, et cetera. This is not meant to be something that's going to drive uh, what we eat now off the market. Uh, and uh, that, I think, answered your question. Oh. The, yeah, well, the other part of the question was what, what, what is standing in the way of this being something that is used regularly on submarines, apart uh, from money, uh, okay. the research part? Okay. Uh, what's standing in the way is uh, the fact that uh, we don't have, uh, well, my, my lab does not at the present time have funding for this. Uh, the Dutch group did have funding from the Dutch government, quite a bit of money. Uh, but they came up with uh, zero results. But what would you be spending the money to find out if you had it? What are the technological barriers to this? Technological barrier? Well, the technological barriers are uh, basic science type things like uh, what kinds of uh, chemical messengers are required to uh, stimulate the uh, muscles to form uh, myotubes and so on and so forth, and uh, also what uh, mechanical stimuli are necessary so, and electrical stimuli, because if you uh, work out, you know that uh, in order to uh, get your uh, biceps to increase in girth and so on, uh, you have to uh, stimulate muscle growth, and you stimulate muscle growth by exercise. If you're growing muscles in a uh, test tube or a petri dish or what have you, they're not exercising, they're just sitting there metabolizing so that they can stay alive. But if you stimulate them somehow, and you have the chemicals that can control muscle growth, then you can collect an increased uh, amount of uh, bulk from the culture. So that's, that's where we stand. What we need is more money for basic science. And uh, investors want results in five years. That's why I like the other question. You know, when, am I, when am I going to get this on the market in five years? You're not going to get it on the market in five years until the basic science is done, is what we tell all of them. So that's, that's the story. Did I answer the question this time? Yes. Yeah, I would love to pass the mic over today. <laughs> and, and, and really, the same question goes back to you. You know, why do we have these in our homes? What, what would it take to get them there? Uh, well, in terms of um, the ability to create them, because there's, at least for now, relatively, really no leap in technology required. I mean, after all, there are insect farms in the U.S. that produce immense amount of insects that are entirely raised as food, just not for human consumption. They're raised for the pet trade, for people's pets, and for fish bait. However, um, my colleagues and I have uh, had recourse to this supply for years, meaning that when the people ask where these crickets and mealworms come from, we tell them, that they come from insect farms in the southern states that produce them as pet food. And we have no, we make no bones about that. So the fact is they've been doing this for a very long time on a variety of scales. Some of them are creating quite a few pounds of insects every day and shipping them out like any other, you would any other food. And uh, of course you don't have the um, hardcore hygiene required. I mean these are open air facilities pretty much. They're, they're growing centers, they're not labs. And so there's no need for any really um, uh, extraordinary hygiene conditions. Um, and uh, you know, there's, there's more to be said about that, but the fact is that not only is it taking place on a practical level now, there are engineers uh, in Canada, both a professor of bioengineering at McGill University, his name is Robert Koch, K-O-K, and his graduate students, a long time ago, circa 20 years ago, created a master's thesis level work on how you feed a city using two or three buildings of that city. 
So it's a very simple matter of, okay, this is the energy you need to put in, this is where you get it from, this is what it costs, this is how much time it takes, how much manpower, and this is your yield. So that was done a long time ago, and more recently, and it's one of the slides, I don't necessarily have to show them, but it is one of the numerous slides from my ESA. ESA is uh, Entomological Society of America. And, uh, and it mentions, you know, from Camille Confortin, and so uh, this, there you go. Um, this is, it's kind of an odd thing, and I, I've been in touch with the, uh, with the author, and I, I don't know, I'm embarrassed to say I don't know his work as well as I should, I have to correspond with him. This is, it looks very much like an insect, but this is a mock-up of a facility that would be, you know, it's, you know it's the scale, right, so the people are there, maybe it's supposed to look like a bug, or maybe it needs to look like a bug, um, or, or maybe it's just whimsy. Uh, this is supposed to be uh, it's a planned facility for growing algae and insects in separate parts of this building, specifically as food. And his thing, uh, he's from the University of Toronto, recent graduate in architecture, and, uh, and I've been meaning to get back in touch with him, and he has this idea that Toronto is a city that can step forward in tor into protein self-sufficiency. So the idea is that the city can take care of its own protein supply. And I'm now keeping in mind, Toronto is hardly a place known for mild winters, and insects require high ambient temperatures to complete their life cycles, or just to survive at all, really. Um, so certainly bread. So uh, I, will you see, please, we hit the next slide? Yeah. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. So you know, this is uh, if you just if 3MF is, is the name of his baby there, third millennium farming, uh, harnessing the ability of microorganisms and micro livestock. Micro livestock and mini livestock are terms that are bandied about quite a bit in the last five or ten years. And some people will say that that includes all animals, you know, smaller than a goat. And others will say, well, you know, it's really small, small animals, uh, snails, insects, worms, etc. So um, there you go. That that is sort of uh, has swept the three and a half revolution has swept away the antagonism between city agriculture and wilderness, grafting farming onto built form while simultaneously allowing nature to creep back into our metropolises and daily lives. And of course, it's certainly true that our divorce from the insect world, meaning a hundred years ago, more people worked the land and therefore they saw what insects could do. I'm drifting a little bit from your question. The answer is, of course, that we have everything we need to have now, the situation is that we don't desperately need it. As, as long as trucks keep delivering affordable beef, pork, chicken, and fish, then there's no motivation to make the change. Which makes, you know, the negative part of me think that we will switch to insects, we'll be ready to switch to insects when it's too late to do so elegantly. And then we'll have to deal with immense amounts of really tragic and horrific societal chaos, you know, instead of bridging the gap. Well, I'm working against that, obviously. But um, you know, insects uh, provoke a knee-jerk ew factor, and most people who have that reaction are not inclined to question why that is in themselves, let alone challenge it. So that those are even more than the money, because hey. Uh, insects are currently expensive for me to serve because they're not subsidized. So therefore, sixteen dollars uh, buys you a thousand crickets. When you process those crickets, that's roughly fourteen ounces, so it's under a pound for sixteen dollars. And other insects can be more. So at this point, they're not really economically viable. They could be pretty much in a heartbeat. Fascinating and. Sorry, I, I actually wanted to ask um, a, a, a sort of question along those lines um, around both kind of, uh, you know, this event is called Thrilling Wonder Stories, and, and as well as the spatial implications of sort of these visions of the near future, we're interested in the stories we tell about them. And one of the things that I think is curious about um, both insects and um, muscle protein production systems, like is that right? Um, are both the stories, the sort of the, the disgust factor, um, the idea that food has to have a certain um, 
narrative or cultural resonance to be recognized as food. And then also, um, and I think Morris, you raised this earlier, so we'll come back to you after Dave's answered, um, the ethics uh, around protein. Um, you know, we're talking about alternative proteins here, um, and that sidesteps a lot of the, the vegetarian, vegan arguments, but yeah. Well, uh, one of the numerous aspects of the subject that I've been wanting to learn is to see about basically quantifying, but there's this term food print, which I, I like very much, a footprint of food, both production and consumption. It's my thesis, and again, I just haven't done enough research, is that one, uh, you can't feed planet Earth on a vegetarian diet. It's just not possible, it, you know, even if it was possible physically, which is doubtful, making it possible economically, wherein some countries have surplus and simply hand it off gratis to places that are hungry, that doesn't work so well. So how do you feed planet Earth with our growing population, 7 billion this month, on a vegetarian diet? If we follow that logic, uh, it, I, I come to this conclusion that a vegetarian, let alone a vegan diet, is a luxury of the athlete. For example, the Tibetan Buddhists eat meat. Why? Because they're up in the mountains where there's not that much and they want to survive, so they eat the meat. The other Buddhists might not, because it's like, well, we don't need to. La la la. You know? So, so the fact is that, uh, that in terms of ethics, well, for me, entomophagy is really about interfacing with nature and getting our food from nature in a new way. And therefore, um, you know, when I catch insects, whether I eat them myself or I serve them or whatever, I'm basically acting like a predator. I mean, I am hunting. And that's, you know, I'm, I'm coming around to the notion that that's a fairly honest way to get food. But insect farming would not would not have that kind of... Well, that's true. But the fact <laughs> is that the un my underlying premise is that we get our food by killing other organisms regardless. So if we want to eat, then organisms have to die. Specifically, in this case, animal organisms. And if we want to play the, I, I wouldn't call it maudlin, but if we want to call play the more emotion-centered card, you know, what would you rather have see, see uh, executed or, or, or you know, euthanized or whatever, killed for food, a cricket or a cow? So the whole idea of, you know, I don't really want to argue, well, an insect's, you know, uh, nervous system is such that it doesn't suffer and doesn't feel pain. Of course it does. It's, it's afraid of death or it acts as though it's fleeing death. So its death is really not really qualitatively different from the death of a mammal, in my view. But I don't believe that humans have the luxury of saying, let's just get by without killing. So if we're going to do it, we're going to eat, then animals will die. And I think that, I mean, a cricket increases its light, its, its size, 1,000 times in seven weeks. And it retains more of the energy from its food, as I was kind of talking about. So in a way, the, the aesthetics of logic make it uh, compelling. And, and similarly, uh, Morris, and from, from your point of view, you started talking about the, the ethics of, uh, of uh, insect consumption and in, in, uh, in vitro meat consumption. I'm sorry, just going to use the shorthand. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but I am curious about, uh, first of all, getting over the disgust factor and whether there's anything there involved for you, and, and then also, uh, yeah, the ethical story behind this kind of meat. As far as the disgust factor is concerned, I think that's mainly uh, connected with the uh, glob type of product that uh, you have picture of on that uh, email. Uh, if, if, the, if you think about it, and uh, it's easy for me to speak about this now because so far we haven't really attempted to uh, raise anything but uh, fish muscle uh, in uh, vitro, that um, if you eat fish, and you take the fish and prepare that fish so that it's edible as far as you're concerned, what you're doing is you're taking your nice sharp knife and chopping off the fish's tail and the fish's head 
and then you uh, remove the uh, fins and the scales and so on, and you end up with something that you uh, then debone by splitting it and removing the uh, spinal column and uh, the other bones uh, of the fish, and then you cook the fish one way or another. Well, pretty much the same thing happens in uh, my lab. That's where we get the tissue to uh, raise in uh, the petri dishes. So what we're doing is just exactly what happens in uh, Red Lobster or some other seafood restaurant, <laughs> uh, or in the supermarket or wherever you get your fish. So uh, it's not a problem for the work that is going on in my lab. That's fish. When we get to the point where we uh, are thinking in terms of uh, fowl, we have done some very preliminary work with uh, chick embryos. And uh, there, I'm not so sure that the same logic of uh, the uh, yuck factor is going to apply. I think there might be a yuck factor involved here because what it involves is removing chick embryos from embryonated eggs, obviously, before they're hatched, and then collecting the muscle that we want to grow, which would mean either breast muscle or leg muscle or what have you. Uh, actually, one of those two would probably be the one of choice. And uh, we made a video of uh, us, well actually it was me, doing this uh, particular operation. And believe me, anybody watching that is pretty disgusted by the time we finished, you know, with the gooey yolk running around all over the place. Things like that, and the chicken's head having to be cut off and things of that nature. It's not, not a pretty thing. So I would say it depends on uh, what the source is and what the product is and so on. Uh, and uh, what was the other part of the question? Of uh, the, the ethics. Yeah. Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, what Dave was speaking about before reminded me of a uh, meeting I went to uh, where I also put everybody to sleep. <laughs> uh, about a year and a half ago, we were discussing the ethics of uh, producing in, in vitro uh, meat, and uh, a lot of the people there were uh, vegetarians, vegans, what have you, and also there were people from PETA and so on and so forth. And uh, what I said is something that uh, I truly believe, and that is that although it's an unfortunate thing. In order for us to live, we humans, we have to kill something else. There's no reason to believe that a plant is any less worthy of living than an animal. I don't care what the animal is. An insect, an amoeba, which is no longer an animal because the classification system has changed what have you. So I think that uh, as far as ethics is concerned, ethics is in the eye of the uh, culture in which the uh, question arises. So here I just saw a whole room full of people munching away on insects. That's fine. If you don't mind doing that, more power to you. I don't see anything ethically wrong with it. As a matter of fact, eating insects is sanctioned in uh, the Bible. If you ever crack the pages of that and look at it, you'll see that uh, one of the things in the uh, Mosaic Codes uh, states that it's okay to eat locusts. So, it's okay to eat locusts, it's okay to eat insects. 
And you've got a sanction in the Bible for that. You're right on Easy Street right now. <laughs> well, on that, on that happy note, <laughs> I, would, I think we have time for just one question, if there is one from the audience. Front row, if that's you get a prize for being the front row. <laughs> Um, I was just curious, so uh, this is kind of topic of impeach on meat, there's been a lot of press about it, and I know I think that the Dutch have been fighting this around issues of sustainability, that kind of meat production is really unsustainable, and this is perhaps the solution, and I was just really curious about that argument, because it seems like all the kind of biochemical processes and everything that's required to grow this kind of meat um, would actually be really energy intensive. Intensive. So I was just curious, you know, your thoughts on that. I'm not sure I all of that. I think it's just a question of can can growing in vitro meat be done in a sustainable manner, or does it take so much energy to keep the oh. tissue growing okay. that um, that actually sort of cancels itself out? And you might as well have a, a you know feedlot. Right. Actually, uh, in Holland, where there was a great deal of uh, interest in this because the money came in, somebody uh, did a, uh, an, ec an economic analysis of the uh, feasibility of growing in vitro meat. The, the meat that they are interested in is uh, pork, and uh, that's what they uh, that's what they uh, concentrated on, and uh, they came up. If I remember the paper, I, I have it and I've read it. Uh, if I remember it correctly, the conclusion was that, uh, like everything else, it eventually would, uh, the cost eventually would be reduced with increased usage. You know, it's the same story in economics with everything. The more people who buy it, the cheaper it gets. The more people will buy it because it's cheaper, and then because it's cheaper, and the more people buy it, then it becomes cheaper, and more people will buy it. Did <laughs> <laughs> I answer the question? What about the cost in terms of energy? It's not, not oh, energy, energy, that's very important, yeah. In terms of energy, uh, the, the, the energy has to, has to be uh, generated uh, from some source. I don't know that anybody's really looked at that very carefully. But, uh, yeah, I mean, if, you, if you've got things growing in a lab, you know that you've got to have uh, electrical power or you can't do anything. Uh, unless you're very uh, rich or you've got uh, a slave economy where you can hire people to stand around for hours to shake things. And, uh, or something like that. So you need electrical motors, and in order to get an electrical motor to run, you need electrical energy, and uh, there's no doubt about that. And of course, that backs into where do you get your electrical energy? Atomic, uh, burning coal, burning natural gas, what have you. Uh, but again, I think that. There's no reason to believe that this technology will not follow the same pathway that they all do. With time, it'll become cheaper across the board, not just energy, everything. And as it becomes cheaper, then more people will want to use it, and so on and so forth. And it will be sustainable. It won't be sustainable right away. Nothing ever is. But the one thing you have to bear in mind is that uh, the rate of achieving sustainability varies with the technology. Everybody here has got a, a laptop or something equivalent to that. Who would have thought of that 10 years ago, right? You can even afford to buy the laptop. See? It was not cheap. 10 years ago, now it's cheaper. So these things uh, more or less take care of themselves, probably. I won't say that absolutely they do, but probably they do. Thank you so much, everybody.